Yeah, first of all, I would like to thank Ilya and Nat Natalia and your organizing committee for having me to here to <coughs> tell you some of this, um, some of the thoughts that I have been having, and as well as some of the historical uh, kind of work that we have been do doing on speech recognition. Uh, I will hope that this presentation will shed some light to you in terms of. Um, and some of the new trends in deep learning that actually goes beyond some of the neural network that you may have seen. Um, so today's talk is mostly focusing on uh, speech. Um, although our lab have been doing most of work in uh, recent years on uh, text, uh, natural language, as well as some image. So we actually also have very active work done on image transcription, uh, captioning work that you heard earlier. Um, and then we actually, our company actually is, is part of the sponsors of this uh, COCO competition. So for this t morning's talk, I probably won't have time to go anything uh, on the image, uh, language side. Um, but I just want, also want to say that this evening there will be a, a panel that uh, will have quite a number of people here to share some other experience in deep learning. So today's uh, presentation here over the next 40 minutes it's going to go through quickly these three parts. It's kind of some history ab about how deep learning enters speech recognition. And I think our Microsoft, uh, in collaboration with uh, a Toronto uh, Professor Jeff Hinton, uh, we actually started uh, exploring this area uh, about six years ago. Um, and in order to talk about this, I also need to show you a little bit about the prior work in speech recognition that have been going on for the last 30 years based upon mostly generative model. And I'm going to show you a little bit connection between how this kind of thinking eventually go move into a deep neural network and what kind of thinking that people in the community are, th are, you know, are having now to further look ahead for the future. Um, and of course, this main part of this talk uh, will show you how um, the current state of art is in this field. Um, actually, I gave about three and a half hours of tutorial on this old topic, you know, speech, language, and part of image. Uh, it's about uh, about just a few weeks ago in Dresden, nearby here. Uh, and today's talk really is to compress all this information into something fairly, uh, fairly, con uh, fairly concrete, and show you a little bit of prospect about what the future look ahead that we're going to have. Uh, so there are some, yeah, you know, some material that I put here. A few books here. Uh, I'm not going to go through all the detail, but today's what uh, was actually show you the general over overview of this whole field. So actually, I wrote this paper a few years ago, two or three years ago. That was just about uh, the time when deep learning uh, was getting started. So the way I uh, this is our the main uh, transaction uh, in this field uh, in speech recognition. So if you don't get chance to uh, to read this journal you really should read. A lot of major papers in this field is published in this IEEE transaction on speech and language processing. So this overview paper that I wrote a few years ago essentially organized machine learning paradigm in speech recognition in terms of these four, four sort of uh, you know, ways of looking at the problem. So if you actually uh, look at speech recognition over the last 30, 40 years, you actually can cat categorize all the work in this area, in terms of think about these four different you know pillars. So if you look at the kind of loss function you will use, you actually can describe the you know most of the work in terms of either generative modeling or discriminative modeling. Um, so th this is actually the main topic of today. So generative mo generative modeling simply means that if you think about you know you got the data, speech data or image data, whatever data you have you know at the bottom, and then your label. Uh, speech, uh, you know, uh, the language, the word sequence, for example, or natural language understanding, or you know, you know, uh, natural language description of image, whatever. At the top, think about this way. I mean, this is the kind of assumption I'm using throughout uh, this talk. So, uh, generative modeling simply is but a top-down approach. You have the hypothesis of your targets or your labels, and then you have the mathematical model that describes what is the likelihood that observation is produced. And then you use the Bayes rule 
to sort of guess what will be the right one. It's kind of basic model, for example. And that's called generative model. And the discriminative model is just opposite. It's bottom up. You have the data, like a neural network, um, multi-layer perception. You get the bottom, uh, you get the data, and then you do directly computation, and you come up with a solution. So that's called uh, general, uh, discriminative. So most of the recent advances of speech recognition and image recognition are all based upon generative modeling paradigm. Okay, um, and the general uh, uh, sorry, it's based upon a uh, discriminative paradigm. And the generative modeling now is taking back seat for a while. Although most of the work of the before deep learning come into speech is done in this way. So now there's the pros and cons of both. I'm going to show you exactly how these two things can be actually synergized to be integrated in such a way that you can get a better result. So this is the one that I uh, have been carefully compiled uh, to show you the two paradigms of, um, of, of learning, machine learning. One is the generative model, one is discriminative model. And neural network that most of people know about belong to discriminative area. Although, if you look at the early history of uh, neural network, like bottom of machine, um, like Sigma, Believe Network, all these networks, they all belong to generative model as well. So now, many of those work now are coming back, and people actually are looking at more theoretical analysis uh, and some better algorithms um, to actually get those neural net based generative model. So today's talk, you know, we're not going to go through all the detail. So when we talk about neural network for today's lecture, you think about this one, just standard neural network. You feed the data in there, you use all this, you know, matrix multiplication and nonlinearity going through multi layers, in, including the time, uh, you know, for the recurrent network to come up with the label sequence, for example. Um, but so if you compare the theoretical uh, advantages and shortcomings of these two styles of this work, you actually can, you know, so I, I, I list about 17 or 15, uh, 15, you know, all the attributes uh, to show the contrast between this style of the work and this style of the models. Um, so the important, yeah, I'm not going to go to all the details, but the important thing is that um, the most important part that I'm going to show you is that uh, in terms of the structure, uh, one is bottom up, for neural network, uh, one is top down for generative model. Okay, so top down versus bottom up, and also in terms of how easy it is to constrain, to impose constraints and domain knowledge, for example, speech information, speech knowledge into the system. This is much more natural. You know, it gives you fine grain detail about how you can incorporate this one, and this is much harder. And also in terms of distribution, mostly this is a neural net is what's called a distributed representation, whereas generative model very often is a local representation. Uh, I don't know if you know, uh, you know some cognitive science, you actually will, will see the difference between the two. Um, and also in terms of scalability, this is much easier, this is much harder, and although people are working on that. So the recent literature in deep generative model in ICML, I don't know whether you get a chance to see the ICML and, and, and NIPS, and various other conferences, you see lots of uh, work now trying to improve the scalability of deep generative model. So today's lecture is really um, sort of uh, I will go, I will jump back and forth, showing your historical path that how this work has been uh, doing and how some of the, this insight for this one actually lead to some of the deep neural network that actually now is popular in speech recognition. So I will start uh, about this historical analysis here. Uh, so don't read this detail, except, you know, I actually, uh, every time I give this talk, uh, you know, um, so people keep telling me that, wow, you know, in the 80s, you know, we do this work. Uh, so actually, it turned out that the neural network are mostly shallow, you know, single hidden layer. Uh, they have been done in the 80s. Uh, so these are the typical, uh, you know, uh, list of paper over here. And most of them, are, are, if I want to use a one single word to describe, you know, there'll be two words, describe the status of this earlier work prior to the deep learning entering into speech in you know, about this time, is that they are not working. Okay, so I gave this talk, a lot of people who work in this area kept, kept fighting with me, saying that it worked well, but in reality, really just there's no impact uh, of this work, this series of work. And although many of these insights are very useful for, you know, for our current way of thinking about uh, uh, neural network in speech recognition. Um, just to show you um, some of the historical, um, you know, uh, path. Uh, I just, so this is uh, the document that has about 80 some pages. Uh, 
written by a little authors here. They are, we are all in speech uh, area. Uh, about 2006 and 2000, uh, about this time. Um, so this is the report uh, required by, um, by the US government. Um, they actually, during this time, uh, not only researchers by ourselves, but also US government, they saw that speech recognition gets stuck. Uh, the error rate just didn't change over roughly about five or six years uh, by that time. Um, and I, I have actually a diagram to show that, you know, in 80s, you know, error just keep dropping, keep dropping. Now, up until about 2009, uh, sorry, 1990, 1990, early, uh, so late 90s, the error really stays pretty much flat. So that was into several years. And the government said, that, well, now let's get together to think about the next step. So they asked many, you know, several of us uh, to actually to go to Washington, D.C. to think about what the future directions are about this time. That was really before neural uh, deep learning came to speech recognition. And then we wrote a very long report. You know, people, you know, we stayed in the hotel room for about five days looking for, you know, all the historical work as well as potential future work for in this area. Look, look at this is about 10 years ago, close to 10 years ago. And then uh, this, this is just one small, small section that we, I, I took out from this. So we talk about some recent examples uh, about the graphical model. Uh, anybody here know much about graphical model here? Okay, if you raise, that's good. Yeah, because I, I I'll say a lot of things about graphical model because in terms of theoretical foundation of deep learning, I think many very important concepts of, of, of graphical model probably will come in the picture. It's very, very different from the, the way that you think about neural network. Uh, random, uh, uh, conditional random fear, anybody know about this? Okay, that's very good, yeah. So those are outlined here. Nobody th even think about neural network at that time, uh, okay? And because it really didn't make uh, a lot of impact here. So, uh, so in this report, we also go back to think about historical work for this graphical model, the Hidemarker model, Gaussian mixture model, all this model. These are, are typically shallow model for, um, you know, tip, uh, it, it's dynamic um, shallow models for, for general human model, okay? So I will have another list over here to show you the general human model for speech recognition prior to the rise of deep learning about 2009. Um, actually, I myself actually spent a lot of time working on this uh, general human model for speech recognition. I, as a matter of fact, the entire community have been working, focusing on hidden Markov model for, um, for 30 some years. So I'm not going to go through the detail except to outline a few important pieces of the earlier work uh, that actually has some ramification to maybe the future direction of uh, uh, the uh, uh, neural network model. So this is the piece of work that I did with, um, with a whole bunch of my colleagues. Um, that was done in Johns Hopkins University in late 90s. And at that time, we actually have this fairly elaborate part of type of uh, deep generative model. So the way it is, is that you hypothesize the label, as I told you, you get a label sequence. Uh, and then from the label sequence, you are able to use the phonetic theory um, that actually came, uh, including speech, uh, speech production model to actually going through various layers, about three or four layers, to essentially generate a acoustic waveform. So the philosophy of using this type of geometry model for doing speech recognition is that you actually match your observation at the output of the model at the bottom level. And from that, you hypothesize what kind of sequence you are going. It's just opposite to what neural network is doing. Right? I'll show you what result this line of work it is and how does it compare with the deep neural ne network so that uh, we actually can understand the pros and cons of both approaches. Um, so this is the model that we develop. Uh, it's called variational inference learning. So every time you have generative model, uh, uh, you know, uh, inference is harder, which is just opposite to neural network. Inference is so easy. All you have to do is go forward pass, you get the output. Right? So there's pros and cons of the two, uh, which I showed in the earlier table. So for example, for, uh, you know, if you model real uh, human speech, uh, speech generation system, you have the brain you know, that has an image generated here. And then through the motor control articulation, through acoustic uh, you know, processing, you actually generate the acoustic waveform. Now, the, uh, in this framework, in terms of generation model, the goal is how to do inverse. You actually can back 
the sequence of the image uh, message. Whereas in neural network, it does the opposite. The direction goes the other way around. You start from you know observation, you know a uh, signal, and then you can go back all over here. It turned out that as of today, neural net is doing so much better. I'll show you why and there are some of the reasons. And then uh, I'm going to show you exactly what kind of problems that deep neural network is having now. Uh, I'll just give one thing. Uh, you know, in, in the context of this uh, model, i just show you that if you have noisy speech down here, you know, the noise, you can model noise well using the general model. Uh, you, can, you can model the observation very, very easily just by looking at you know, the generative process. It's very, very simple. Uh, it's very simple, right? Your noisy speech really is the speech plus noise. And even that simple constraint couldn't be integrated into neural net easily. It's very hard to do that. You know, people have been working years. In of the last two or three years, I tried to. The people actually just use a very, very simple, you know, transformation to do that. And the result is not hardly as good as the way, uh, you know, we do that general model. So there are, you know, when people are looking at more realistic, uh, you know, a real world application in, um, in. In deep neural network, uh, people are now facing this problem. Well, of course, in, in, if you look at the Google's recent work, they, they, they are very, very, very sim uh, straightforward approach. They say, well, if, even if I don't know how to model noise process, it doesn't matter. We just add the noise into the system. So they blow up the input space by about a fold, about 20 times. Now, in Baidu, they blow up to about 200 times. Uh, well, whatever factor it is, you, there's a brute force over doing that. But this is, yeah, so this is actually come to the discussion tonight. <laughs> okay, how do we combine different styles of machine learning to really make deep learning better than the way it is now? Okay, so there are many solutions uh, which are very much brute force uh, a way of solving the problem using big data, using big computation. Uh, in the Microsoft, we have that all these infrastructure. Google has them, and Baidu has them. But if you are looking at you know small companies, uh, and then if you are looking at the you know the research uh, the research group that actually have limited resources, there's just no way people can do the way that brute force approach is doing. Uh, but anyway, so I'll show you. Uh, this is also still a part of the uh, the historical uh, review. So in about 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 ten years ago, so I myself and you know some of my colleagues, like uh, Hagai, Adius, and, and some people, we are actually looking at the rigorous. Uh, you know, variational inference method to do this type of inference. So this is one of the papers that we wrote. But it turns out that the difficulty of doing inference here for deep generation model is that your inference it really is not a trivial issue. It's this is opposite to neural network. <laughs> neural network, no problem. Multiply uh, your, you know, your your matrix a few times. You use nonlinearity, you actually get a solution. So inference is very easy for neural network. Whereas it's very hard for this, and this is the work that try to um, this is really try to uh, to do really um, sort of scientific research to figure out exactly what this approach is, uh, is going to. Do. So how many people know uh, 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 variational learning here? Okay, if you yeah, not many people raise the hand. Uh, these are uh, so this is now this type of learning is coming back. If you read the, uh, last year's literature. Within two years of literature in machine learning, this is really coming back. Uh, you know, the deep mind uh, people they do, they have been doing most of the work in this area. So about ten years ago, we used this method, which uh, was uh, not very successful. I tell you the reason why. So one of the fundamental for those of you who don't know much about this variational learning, um, uh, so the whole point for today's lecture is not to say uh, deep learning neural net is everything. I'm just it's it's just opposite. I'm actually trying to argue that uh, that deep, ne uh, deep neural network is uh, having tremendous impact. Actually, uh, that was actually originally started with my group at, at Microsoft. You know, working with uh, Jeff Hinton uh, here uh, there. Uh, I'm just trying to inject some new thinkings in such a way that our future direction can be such that it can go beyond what neural net is, has been doing. Okay, the neural network is doing. So this is one of the things that. That 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 happened. Uh, that was you know uh, ten years ago. So if you have this, so actually we use a fairly simple model. Right? So this uh, linear, uh, so nonlinear dynamic system model. You have these dynamics in the hidden space. You have dynamics in the uh, in the label space. And you have observation. Simple model. So in order to do inference from here to here, actually, the inference has to make assumption. You know, this is one of the very common assumptions. You have to factorize the result. If you don't factorize the result, it, the, the inference problem is intractable. This is very, very different from, uh, from neural network. Uh, so the way to do uh, 
uh, you know, inference approximation is a Q function. You actually have to assume, well, there are many ways of doing that. This, the one way is that you said, well, this dynamics in the continuous uh, hidden space uh, has to be factorized. Uh, otherwise, you won't be able to, to do the, all the learning. So we tried that. And the result is amazing. Okay, that was about, that's about 10 years ago. So actually, we've, uh, we actually published a few papers around that time. So uh, for those of you who know the speech, you actually can see that all the hidden dynamics, this is a, is, it's a hidden dynamics over here, it can be represented in terms of you know, what's called resonance in the vocal track, which is shown in terms of the darkness over here. You actually track really well, even after you use that very you know, high degree of approximation in terms of factorizing the posterior probability. Um, so now, uh, now the problem is that when you are talking about the label discrete level, so if you do this uh, inference using that variation learning algorithm going through you know, a few layers, in terms of the latent variable, which is continuous, the result is really good. I mean, people never see this kind of result before. So actually, this became our pro byproduct of the work about at Microsoft about 10 years ago. But if you do inference on the top of the model in terms of the sequence, which is the speech recognition result, result is not as good as we thought it would be. It's a very, very strong result, but it's not just, not as, still it makes a lot of errors. So I'm going to, uh, to show you a little bit about this result. Now, before I show you the result, I'm just going to show you there's another type of deep generation model that was published by Jeff Hinton uh, and his colleagues. This is actually probably the, the most famous paper in deep learning. But notice that this initial paper in deep learning that was published in 2006 is completely deep generative model. It's, not, it's really not the, uh, the neural network that you are familiar with now. Um, but in any case, I'm not going to go through the details about it. And that actually is a very interesting paper that actually excited my interest in about 2008, uh, 2009. It's just a couple of years after this paper was published. So this is what's called the, uh, uh, so the deep, uh, it's called the Deep Belief Network. It's actually a general model. Uh, it has a very intriguing property compared with the deep general model I showed you earlier. Namely, um, the inference um, that is a, so let me see. So there's a totally non-obvious result. That means that, uh, well, if you stack up this uh, RBM a few times, you actually get this model. It's not obvious how you get that, okay? But this paper actually explains and then with the mathematical sort of, sort of rigor to show you that uh, this DBN is actually um, you know, uh, formed by stacking up s several RBM. So the most intriguing result of this paper was that the inference is extremely easy. So the inference uh, algorithm for this type of deep generational model, because the restriction on not having the same layer to be correlated, to be connected to each other, actually, it actually solved the problem of the original uh, variational base that would require you to factorize you know, your, 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 your hidden layer. Um, therefore, uh, so that's really you know, the paper that caught uh, my attention. Um, and, and that re so we actually compare this model with the generative model. These are two different types of deep generative model. We actually got, um, um, so the company is so much intrigued on this type of work. So we actually invite Jeff Hinton to come to work with me at, uh, at Microsoft. And I'll show you a little bit about, about how that kind of collaboration goes. Um, so, okay, so this is pretty much, uh, yeah, this is actually, so the, this model I showed you about, uh, earlier about this model, the generation model, you can actually model um, the noisy speech. You can model the relationship between articulation and acoustics. You can model the relation between the labels with the latent continuous variable in terms of dynamics. They're all modeled over here. But the difficulty is that the inference is hard, right? But at the same time, so this, uh, so Hinton, uh, Jeff Hinton and his group actually has, this, has done a really fantastic work of using this uh, deep belief network work. So now, if you actually put the back, back propagation on top of DBA, actually the result is it's even slightly better than this model that we have shown here. This is a much more complicated model. Uh, whereas the one I showed you earlier, the deep belief network, you actually can do inference much easier because of special constraint imposed on this. So, uh, so the point of this model is as follows. I'm going to show you a little history of this model. So if you actually do uh, speech modeling to understand exactly how you know, latent variable behaves, you actually can get a lot of insight to what the speech uh, you know, uh, uh, generation process looks like. For example, this is one speech sound. This is the same 
you just speak faster. Every time you speak faster, this label and this label, so the label account are associated with this speech versus the label of this speech, and they're all the same. But look at the acoustic, they're very, very different. And that kind of difference can be very easily modeled using generation model. You know, it's called linear dynamic, well, actually, non linear dynamic system. Uh, you actually can model that very easy, you know, to say that, you know, if you actually speed up speaking rate, which is one of the parameters in the model, you actually can account for this, be the same as this, be the same as this, in terms of our labels. But I'm not going to go through the detail, uh, except to let you know that this result, uh, so this model actually generates some very strong uh, result in this, uh, in this what's called the timid. Uh, uh, so, so I think I, work, I evaluate this model on the team. We also evaluate in the larger tasks, but the com com complexity is so high that for large tasks, usually you know it takes takes much more computation to do this model than to do even neural network. <laughs> so, okay. Um, so, so I'm, now I'm coming to this uh, academic industrial collaboration during this time. So I invite Jeff Hinton to work uh, work with me. Actually, he came here twice. He made two trips coming here in my lab in Redmond. So we actually physically work in the same office. So this is a very t well timed academic industrial uh, uh, collaboration. And on the one hand, our speech industry, uh, like Microsoft, uh, IBM, you know, at that, uh, I think at that time Google just started doing uh, speech, um, uh, not not for very long. So the entire speech industry have been looking for new solutions, while the principal general approach could not deliver the kind of things that we would like to have. At the same time, uh, academia. Uh, typically, uh, you know, I, I probably would more refer to uh, University of Toronto. They develop this very nice, uh, much uh, deep learning tool that's also based on a generative model. Uh, they are looking for applications. So, if you add the uh, back propagation algorithm into this deep generative model, which is DBN, you actually can have something called a deep neural network, and that well, essentially, in the early days of uh, deep learning, you actually have the hybrid. Uh, generative and discriminative model. You use the generative model to initialize the deep neural network, and then you use discriminative learning to learn, uh, you know, discriminative model. It also, this is about the time that the uh, GPU just coming out. Uh, think about uh, GPU, the hardware came out a long time ago. Now the CUDA library that is essential for running uh, this kind of uh, neural network just about released about one year or two years before we started this collaboration. Everything is ready. And also, most importantly, around this time, uh, for speech recognition, big data are available. Um, so I think US government, um, as well as all the funding agency in speech, well, in, that's typically um, in, 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 in the US government, they all fully realize how important it is to have the big data available. So the data collection started about in 1980s. So the whole community uh, have been equipped with the large amount of deep data, uh, the large amount of training data with the labels. And all of those uh, makes the uh, academic uh, industrial collaboration really uh, nice uh, during that, you know, about five, six, uh, about five years, six years ago. So one of the things we did uh, with uh, Professor Jeff Hinton's group was that we actually organized this uh, workshop at NIPS. How many people actually went to NIPS uh, during during this uh, for this year, 1999, uh, 2009? So anybody actually attended this workshop? Not many. Okay. So actually, I went to various uh, talks some, uh, in various places. It actually is a full room of people. Uh, so we um, we actually uh, survey. Uh, many of these uh, deep generation models that we talked about earlier, including uh, Jeff Hinton gave you a tutorial. I gave a tutorial in this uh, also in this workshop, and then he talked about this DBA work, uh, showing exactly how this deep generation model DBA in terms of generation pro properties using this cartoon. I don't know if you haven't seen that, then, then don't worry about it. Um, so now. So since our earlier collaboration and also some initial work, um, you know, uh, applying um, DBN initialize uh, deep, uh, deep neural network uh, for speech recognition, um, and the result is just uh, even slightly better than the real rigorous implementation through this uh, variational learning. We actually uh, fully believe that this is the right thing to do for large scale. So uh, mostly uh, at, at Microsoft Research about this, you know, uh, after uh, Jeff Kinton actually 
uh, you know, consulted with and then gave us uh, tons of good ideas about all different ways of doing uh, deep learning. So we uh, decided to go full force for industrial style of uh, speech recognition. So one of the most important work that was done during this period was to say that in order to put this deep neural network into speech recognition, you couldn't just do you know academic style of the uh, you know deep uh, the neural network because it's very hard to scale up. So one very important thing that insight that I want to give you uh, during this talk, uh, this coming from the lesson that we learned about uh, about five years ago, was that we really have to match whatever deep learning method into the existing pipeline for real time decoding, and that's very important. So in the industrial world, if your product doesn't come up with the you know, runtime efficiency and the customer are not going to like it. So from the day one, when we started deep neural network, uh, deep learning uh, about six years ago at Microsoft, we realized that we actually have to match our decoding structure. Now the decoding structure at that time is what's called the hidden Markov model, uh, which is called the context dependent hidden Markov model. So I don't have time to go through the detail, but in essence, what happens was that since the um, since the um, um, the shallow model of the Markov hidden Markov model and Gaussian matrix model so is so weak in terms of modeling the structure of the speech, we have to make the output very large. Like um, for example, if you get a phone name, English phone name, like forty-five phones. It's, if you use the phone name as the output. 45 units in the neural network. That's uh, this is just like you know the equivalence. You are not going to get any good result at all. So you have to make the output to be context dependent, saying that you know each phoneme for the left context and the right context they are behaving very differently. You model all this Cartesian product of the a uh, segment uh, multiple phones. That's called context dependent model. Then you get much better result, and it's understood. It's very understandable from generation uh, model viewpoint. Now, for neural network research, we do the same thing. Therefore, we expand our model from about about 100 to 200 units to all the way. I mean, uh, this is the number. So, if you get the 50, uh, if you get the 50, uh, you know, forms, for example, then what happens is that you have, uh, you know, each. Uh, State in hidden Markov model has three states. You multiply by three, you get a somewhere around 150 to 200 phones, and we drastically in increase this one to about up to about 30,000. Okay, so the reason why it's so large is because you get left and then right, you get Cartesian product, and of course you eliminate those which never occur, and then you get about tens of thousands. And this is so essentially the neural network goes as follows. That was you know so this architecture still remains today. So you start with the neural network building up. And then at the last layer, all of a sudden it becomes huge. It's very, very large. And so the trick which I don't have is so how many people here are doing speech here? Okay, not many, okay. So uh so then I, I won't go through all the detail. So the architecture goes like this. Small, 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 small. Yeah, small means about two thousand units, right? And all of a sudden at the top it gets about thirty thousand. Okay. And that's the kind of architecture uh, that people are using. And that turned out that to be giving huge improvement for the accuracy of speech recognition. And which we found it out at Microsoft. In the beginning, it's very hard to believe that, right? Because you get such a big network. You get 2,000 by 30,000. And all by that, just upper layer, upper layer, you get about how many million? It's about uh, you know, 30,000. It's about 100 million parameters. Just single layer, <laughs> you get so much. Um, but anyway, so it requires a huge amount of engineering work. So I'm going to, yeah, so I listed a few references that was early work done by Microsoft together with um, uh, in Toronto uh, researchers as well as some IBM. IBM also was involved at that time. Um, so the, the, there's a huge amount of engineering work for building this large space. So it turned out that um, and at the same time, we actually discovered that with large amount of training data, back propagation works much better, uh, actually much, well, not better, I mean, it worked almost as well in the beginning, but later on, it turned out to work much better if you uh, do this kind of pre-training uh, in a while. It actually doesn't require the uh, DBM pre-training. And the reason why we actually remove our pre-training, the one that DBM gave, was actually we fully understood why gradient often vanished. So we actually even filed a patent for discriminatory pre-training at that time. So with uh, a whole bunch of my, my colleagues here. 
But anyway, so this is the architecture that came up with, uh, we came up with about six years ago at Microsoft. So you have this uh, observation in the speech. Uh, you use a very large window, and then you go through many layers, nonlinear transformation. And then at the upper layer, you get a very large, what's called a tied trifold state directly. So that's a huge, and then of course, once you do that, you fit that into the hitting marker model, and then you get actually the very best result at that time. Um, so I'll show you some of the earlier work here. So for this uh, TEMIC uh, database, it's about three hours of training data. Uh, if we actually use the deep neural network, uh, so the, all this work was done uh, uh, at Microsoft, although earlier work was done actually done by uh, University of Toronto. So we actually uh, compare the pre-deep DNA result with the DNA, so it's roughly about 10% of the error reduction. Now, when you increase the amount of data by 10 folds, so this is roughly about 1.2 million samples. So you get about 10 times more, 10 million samples. You actually show, we can actually show that the improvement for the accuracy error rate dropped by about 20%. And that's unusual, right? Usually the bigger data you have, the more difficult things you might have. Uh, and now, uh, so also this is what also done uh, by my uh, colleagues uh, at Microsoft. Uh, you get another 10 times fold of increase, close to 1 billion kind of uh, size of the, uh, the, of the training set. Um, and the error rate dropped from here to here. That's uh, roughly about 30% of error rate reduction. So essentially, we showed that now for deep neural network, the more data, really the better. And that wasn't quite accepted about five, six years ago. Right? So big data really plays an important role in uh, deep generation, uh, sorry, uh, deep, uh, this is deep, uh, deep neural network, which is deep uh, discriminant learning. Okay, and then since then, uh, the rest is the history. Uh, so once we, you know, all these results came out, uh, New York Times actually reported this, uh, you know, the result. And this is my boss, uh, uh, Rick Rashid, giving this big demo using this model, uh, train the system to do translation, you know, in the, in the audience of about 3,000 people. Um, so all the deep learning has been incorporated into the system about 2012. And that was uh, giving a huge uh, excitement for the whole community about how deep learning uh, is actually improving speech, you know, translate, uh, speech translation at that time. Um, and then this article, 2012, actually details about what is. And then I think Jeff Hinton's photo is also shown up over here, highlighting the collaboration between uh, Toronto with Microsoft actually uh, gives rise to industrial success of deep speech recognition. Um, and so the a diagram looks like this. So this is the error rate uh, for this conversational speech. Um, so yeah, you don't see about this. This is about uh, 1993. This is task, you know, started about 1993, about 20 years ago. Error rate is almost 100% in the beginning. Right? So people use the shallow model work to work on this for about, you know, up, this is about 2000, about error rate drastically reduced. Now within 10 years, almost nothing changes for this. And then this is the time that the uh, neural network started, you know, working in, uh, going into speech recognition. The error rate drastically dropped down here. And then for the demo, the error even dropped down to about 7%. And that's how he was able to give, to come out to give the demo for this. And this success was actually featured in uh, MIT uh, technology uh, re uh, review to list deep learning to be one of the, actually the top breakthrough technology in 2013. And when, uh, if you look at details about the, how this deep learning, it, uh, it actually talks about um, and translation speech in real time. That actually refers to the uh, you know, uh, Microsoft demo, the one I just showed you earlier. And then, of course, later on, uh, so once all this information is coming out, uh, everybody is jumping into the system here, uh, into this approach. Um, uh, so, so most of people use this until just um, until about last year. So this year, things change. I'm going to show you exactly how things change from here. So this architecture, uh, b uh, since Microsoft started uh, in 2010, uh, was popular all until about last year. So the next part of the talk is to show what changed since last year. Um, and then of course, uh, all this, uh, this is uh, Google now is using the same technology until last year. I'm going to show you the new things that, that Google has been doing. They actually just reported this result about, uh, about one month ago in Dresden, right here. And then Siri is working on that. Uh, and uh, Microsoft Cortana is using this. Uh, our Skype translator is using this. So this is our new CEO. He, uh, so, but anyway, so 
everywhere in speech technology use deep learning, typically deep neural network. So we are very happy to see that. And then all, everybody reported the error rate dropped by more than half compared to the old way. Uh, and, then, and then, of course, you know, all the media, as so myself, uh, uh, if you read the CNN report, you know, Wired report, they also talk about you know, exactly how, how this, uh, you know, univers they even talk about universe translate. So many of those are all power, empowered by deep neural network that I showed you earlier. So it's more than just deep neural now. There's also recurrent neural network coming in the picture. So I'm going to show you uh, in a moment how. Uh, so, I'm sh the, so the second part of the talk is about state of the art and the f uh, with the further uh, innovations. So the conclusion of this part is that uh, this whole um, technology nowadays is dominated by deep discriminative model, DNA. Uh, you have to do back propagation, otherwise you never get any good result. Um, and so most of this deep generation model, uh, sorry, deep discriminative model is based upon deep neural network and many of the variants, including recurrent network, including LSTM, including now the newer ways of doing that is called sequence to sequence learning. So I'm going to spend very quickly, spend you know ten minutes, very quickly going through um, all, all these new innovations since the earlier work that I show you so far. Okay, so so this part of history, that's it. So the work over here started about 2011 until now. I'm going to show you about last five years of work. So one major innovation is to have better optimization. So if you ju just use the standard uh, deep neural network, you may think that uh, it's just cross entropy learning. Everybody knows cross entropy learning, so I don't have time to go through all this. Uh, cross entropy learning gives you bad propagation when you get multi-class um, uh, classification. And it turned out that that criteria that was popular in 2010 and 2011 at that time soon was overcome by what's called a sequence discriminative training because ultimately the goal is not just you know classify individual frames right you want to classify the entire sequence so how do you do that um and people come up with i yeah i myself initially uh work with uh the uh, his uh you know jeff hinton's student phd uh, phd student coming to our lab that was as early as about 2010. We initially explore this approach using full sequence training. Therefore, rather than optimizing uh, cross entropy, you actually optimizing the what's called maximum mutual information over the whole sequence. And it, it turned out that if you do, it's it, a lot of technical detail. So the first trial about five years ago didn't succeed. Yeah, you know, we didn't get better result because it overfit the data very quickly. So soon after that, uh, within two years, uh, there are a few papers, uh, by, this is by IBM, this is by Microsoft, with my colleagues. Uh, we actually improved uh, the method of overcoming the overfitting, and then it turned out that the error rate further dropped by 15% compared with the deep neural network that you showed earlier. So this is a big, big advancement. Uh, and also in Google, uh, at that time, uh, 2012, NIPS, they published this very influential paper using distributed asynchronous stochastic gradient descent that really speed up all uh, the training by, you know, by factors, uh, uh, orders of very large amount. Okay, so the second aspect of innovation is, uh, this is really follow the deep learning philosophy. You go back to the raw data. You don't do feature engineering, right? So in early days, um, that was about in speech recognition, about 20, about 20 years, people have been using uh, this technique called the MFCC. Anybody know about this word? Male frequency capture coefficient. That's very popular. Everybody used that until 2010, <laughs> around that. So I myself, and work, yeah, actually I'm working with uh, Jeff Hinton and some of his, uh, his colleagues. We actually published the very, very early paper in 2010 to show that uh, you can simply use the speech spectrogram. Yeah, at that time, we were uh, working on this deep autoencoder work. Um, and to show that uh, you actually can use the speech, it's just a Fourier transform, you know, taking logarithm, without having to do all this sophisticated transformation that gives rise to male frequency capture coefficient. We actually can do much better um, in the deep autoencoder setup using spectrogram compared with the uh, 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 male frequency capture coefficient. Now, everybody get rid of uh, male MFCC. No more MFCC. So it's really officially that. Okay. Oh, so I'm, my time is up. Uh, but anyway, and then now people are trying to remove uh, Fourier transform as well. So uh, let me go going through quickly. Uh, now, uh, 
multilingual acoustic modeling, you know, we can do, you know, translingual from one to another. You, you train English uh, speech recognition, you can use that for Chinese uh, with reasonably good clarity. So I, my time is up. So let me go through uh, better architecture. So this part is important, L LSTM um, and ensemble learning um, and then better objective function. Uh, this is a new paradigm, which I don't have to, to talk about. Uh, and the pers a perspective of recent innovation essentially says that everything that we talk about here in terms of renovation is based on this deep generative model. You need to have the label. Now, how do we use discriminative model to improve over those? Um, and that comes down to the prospect. I'll use the two minutes to go through all this part. But and in the evening, we may have something to talk about this kind of future direction more. So how to integrate uh, generative and discriminative model and how to use multimodal and semantic modeling to improve the, uh, the, the, the system. So going back to deep generation model, uh, which I don't have time to go through here. Uh, so, the, uh, so, so there is also, I have also a lot of thought and also among the industry how unsupervised machine learning might finally become possible. Uh, um, not in terms of neural network. For neural network, you have to have a label. Well, you just can't even talk about unsupervised learning. Um, so some of the thought I'm probably going to share uh, tonight. Uh, and some new advances in uh, inference algorithms for deep transfer model. You know, typically, that was last year's ICMM. There are tons of papers on that. Uh, and then multi-modal learning, how do you actually combine image, the one you heard earlier, with the speech and with the text to help you to do distance supervised learning. And this is the, you know, actually I have the whole hour's talk on this. So it's one single slide to let you know. Summary, almost done. Uh, now speech recognition is the very first success case of deep uh, learning in industrial scale. And the early work did not succeed, but they provided the seeding work for inroads of deep neural network to speech recognition, the way I survey during my first part of the talk. Uh, and then academic industrial collaboration, how important it is, and how, uh, which I don't, I didn't get time to talk about the analysis on the errors, otherwise you probably get more, uh, you will probably get more convinced uh, evidence. And how the use of big context dependent model as output layer lead to huge error reduction. And I also show you uh, with the large label uh, training data, how the need for Generative pre training can be eliminated. Uh, and the current state of the art is based upon LSTM, which I didn't have time to go through. I showed a few slides. And also, finally, I show you that there's, there are many weaknesses of this model. And that's my final slides about future duration. So I'm going to stop here. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Questions, please? Yes, please. I like genera generative models you have told, uh, spoken about, but uh, uh, if I use it with, a big, with big data, and okay. I mean really big data, uh, the inference is too slow, so I'm forced to use generative models, sorry, discriminative models, discriminative, correct. usually. Correct. Do you think uh, this, uh, this problem will change in the near future? Well, I think about within three years. There will be, I will see, I expect to see more integration between the two. So if you read, uh, that's, that's a serious paper coming out, uh, actually last year's ICML and also NIPS as well. I think the uh, NIPS in uh, December this year, you are going to see tons of paper as well in that people actually are working on overcoming the inference um, computational difficulty now. So I think within two or three years, you will see, you know, that's my prediction, we see the combination between the two. Okay, thank you. Okay, one more. Okay. Yes, no? one more Please. question here. Thank you very much. Uh, I, I just, uh, I have a kind of simplistic uh, view yeah. of, of the deep learning. Yeah. And I would like you to comment. Yeah, uh, Please. If I am wrong, then yeah. tell me what. Uh, so to me, the deep learning is uh, a kind of uh, the paradigm that before doing learning, you must develop uh, good features. No. Good features. So it's not? I don't, I don't believe that. So I, I personally believe that the learning, uh, not before the learning, the way that you derive the feature is integrated with you do the final discriminative learning. Uh, and then I will agree with you. If you mean that, it will be agree. So not before. I think it's integrated. 
Well, still, you are in the, in the, in the beginning of the process, this yeah. the deep learning thing. Okay, okay. If you, yeah, if you agree with what I just said of earlier, course. we are in agreement. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, I think it is uh, for discussion. Yep, great. Okay.